Cenk Uger from the Young Turks made some uh, news. I believe it was last night or the night before. Um, when he tweeted out his frustration with democratic politics in his hometown, the City of Angels, which, uh, of course, is having a very high-profile mayoral election in less than two weeks now. He tweets out, L.A. is a mess. There's trash all over the road. Oh, we should do it. Here, Russell, go ahead. Read it, read it as Jenk, our resident impressionist, Russell Dobular. L.A. is a mess. There's trash all over the roads. Cops don't respond to calls. It's close to anarchy here. Is Garcetti already in Mumbai? Is anyone running this city? Karen Bass seems to be saying she's going to maintain the status quo. She knows how to work the system. No thanks. Excellent job. Thank you. Excellent Thank you. job. I tried, I tried to get the bulgy eyes. All right. Well, here uh, comes your, your big one here. So then this guy, uh, who I don't know who this guy is, Alex Michelson, asked... Are you voting Caruso in reference to Rick Caruso, the billionaire real estate real estate entrepreneur? Sorry about that, uh, and former GOP or who only registered as a Democrat uh, as late as this January, so that he can run uh, for mayor in L.A. without getting his ass kicked. So, are you voting Caruso? Here we go. Yes. Karen Bass's now, main message. Now, hold on. Cut, cut. I'm going to ask you to take it from the top. I know you're going to have to go a little off book here and off script, uh -huh. and you're not going to read uh -huh. it exactly right. But what's a, yeah. what's a sort of two-word synonym for yes that Jenk is known to, to say that I think you can Of course! With? There we go. Karen Bass's main message seems to be that she is an establishment Democrat. No interest who thinks things in L.A. are generally fine. They're not. And will work the system better. The problem is the system. There is nothing but incompetence and corruption here. We need change. All right. So Jank Uger has had enough. He's had enough. On they behalf of the band, I hope we pass the audition. Yeah, no, I thought that was I thought that was very well done. Uh, Lisa. Welcome, Lisa. I haven't seen you here before. Please make sure you subscribe to the channel, everybody, and like this stream. You forgot to vigorously shake your head and bang on the desk. All right, that's a note for next time. Don't bang on the desk, by the way. The, he, Russell's setup there is very fragile. If he bangs on the desk, his light will fall, the microphone will fall, the laptop will restart. This fucking this building might come down. <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday, while we're, we were setting up, what is it? Your curtain rod literally just fell over. Yeah, you know what? You know what it was like. The piece of molding it was in came off the wall. Oh yeah, so there you go. So it's fragile. So you got to watch with the banging that, on the desk. That, that was what I discovered later. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, my take on this is fairly simple. I mean, um, it's not a surprise to me that a rich guy like Jenk, when he does step outside the Democratic Party, it is to the right and not to the left. You know, um, he expects people to the left of the party to fall in line come general election season, unless there's a former Republican on the ballots uh, who promises to clean up the streets and hire, I think it's 1,500 more cops this guy wants to hire on top of an already, I believe, $7 billion budget uh, for the Los Angeles PD. Um, and so, you know, that's not a big surprise to me. In terms of him not uh, wanting he, to support— He also wants to add 8,000 homeless beds at a cost of about 800 million oh really okay yes all right so look um i don't blame him for not wanting to vote for karen bass i think it is telling that he's going as far as to announce online uh that he is supporting this guy who is a real estate mogul i mean this just this speaks to an issue that i think a lot of rich people uh don't quite understand or either don't want to understand they're not incentivized to understand which is that the commodification of housing leads to housing crises leads to homelessness yes. and so the irony of, of 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 voting in a billionaire real estate mogul because you're upset about the homeless problem that's kind of self-explanatory in my view um, but it's something that, you know, this kind of transcends politics because, you know, you're eating outside in Soho at the little roped off tables, whatever, um, whether you're right wing, left wing, apolitical, whatever, um, you don't want to be bothered by someone coming up to you and asking for money. You want that shit out of sight, out of mind. And so 
you know, this speaks to a certain class privilege um, mm-hmm. that I think transcends whatever your politics are or what you claim uh, they are. And so not too surprising here. I am surprised that he actually went out and said, yes, I'm vote because he knew that was going to blow up. I mean, he knew that right. was going to be a right. thing. Right. Um, OK. In the interest of uh, this is going to be one of those moments where uh, I'm going to demonstrate my bona fides as an honest broker, because I would contend nobody is nastier with these people like Cenk Uger or Anna than I am. No, nobody. Some people are, are, are as nasty, but I would argue nobody's nastier. Um, I, I, I can see why he would wind up voting this way and to say, you know, and he, I, I looked at his whole tweet storm there. He made the argument. He kind of flipped what you're saying on its head that really it's the working class and the poor who have to deal with the realities on the ground of these overlapping crime and homelessness crises. Now that doesn't invalidate what you're saying about the cause of it. But when you're talking about the effect of it, Listen, the people in Malibu don't have 10 cities. Those people don't get anywhere near where they fucking live. So in the end, yes, you could say that this is a crisis caused by uh, by people like Caruso. But you can't say the people who are primarily affected by it are the privileged. The people who are primarily affected are the people who don't have the money to live behind tinted glass and uh, be ushered around from one uh, one perfectly curated environment to another. Um, All right, you know what? That that Before is how. Go it, on. Let me just prove that I'm an honest broker because I will concede that point. Given we're talking about Los Angeles, like in New York, everybody has to deal with everything because everybody is right on top of each other. There's homeless people everywhere in New York, so you could be walking around Tribeca from high end clothing store to high end clothing store, and you're going to encounter homeless people who are going to ask you for money. So, yes, I will admit that. In L.A., it is different because L.A. is much more segregated according to how much money people have it's, because it's everybody a, it's drives a around in cars. Place. Yeah. yeah, exactly. All right. So, point it's, taken. It's very creepy there. I, I'm a big Raymond Chandler fan. I did not completely understand Chandler's work until I spent some time in L.A. Because all of his, uh, for those of you not familiar, mm-hmm. he was really the inventor of American detective fiction, as as we know it, the hard-boiled detective. Um and his novels are all very weird shit going on behind gated mansions and closed doors and bizarre things that the detective has to uncover. And that makes sense to you once you go to L.A. because there's no neighborhoods. There's no community. It's right, a bunch right, of people exactly. living in their little isolated world where you just don't know what freaky shit could be going on behind that gate. You have no idea because there nobody's around, right? right? Everyone's just isolated from everybody else. And right. then they're just isolated in their car and, you know, going to wherever they're going. It's for, for New Yorkers, for people from the East Coast, which, you know, because of its proximity to Europe is more European. My theory of America for my travels is the further west you go, the more purely American the culture becomes. The further well, sure. east you are, the more European the culture is. So oh, that's we, easy. I mean, yes, that's not. I mean, that's a good theory. That's based on the history of the country. I well, mean, exactly. Well, exactly. Came here, settled here, and set up shop yeah, yeah. here. Well, and then, well, and ca- ca- you know, by, we and, and by, west. Yeah, and by the time they get to California, the American experience has transformed them. In right. a way that people who stayed in these areas right, sure, were not transformed. California was for people for whom leaving the old world just wasn't good enough, right? They right, had to go right. all the way to the end of the fucking <laughs> continent <laughs> to be satisfied. And you you wind up with a place that in its heyday had some really interesting, creative um people and cultures and areas um but at its worst it always attracted you know flakes and nut jobs and weirdos you know it always had that element it seems like it's tipped in that direction now and you know that's part of why the it it's like a collapsing 
civilization, which, you know, I mean, there's a lot of that going around, but it seems to California seems to be getting there first, um, which is a lot of what people are reacting to. I mean, looking at this from a distance and I want to make it clear, I'm not an expert on L.A. local politics on the L.A. scene. I haven't my whole paternal side of the family is out there, but I haven't been there in a very long time. Um, but I do know that it has the largest homeless population in America. And I know that when New York was similarly regarded as this collapsing place full of homeless people, uh, that's how we got Giuliani. So it would be pretty, pretty much history repeating itself if a heavily Democratic city like Los Angeles, just like New York, voted in Giuliani, which, look, this guy Caruso, from all the research I've done, is a, is a de facto Republican. It would not oh, yeah. be surprising if you elect, if, if Los Angeles, in the face of 41,000 homeless people, decides, fuck it, let's vote for the guy who promises to make the trains run on time. That was exactly the appeal of Giuliani, because he's not just talking about adding these homeless beds. He's also talking about, as you say, beefing up the police department and cracking down on the homeless encampments. And that was what Giuliani ran on. And he won on that. He won two terms on that. Listen, when people are scared, when there's crime, when there's homelessness, uh, you know, there aren't enough rich people to win an election. If the if the working class and the and the poor didn't feel threatened by it, you couldn't win on that. But you usually can win on that if the situation is really present sometimes even when it isn't but when it is that's the best issue you can have to run on really crime because it it, it that hits people on such a visceral level their personal safety i will say and i understand los angeles i mean i know from the numbers los angeles has gotten much worse since the last time i was there i've never seen anything like some of the things i've seen in los angeles like you go to downtown los angeles it's like a zombie movie i mean it's just hordes and hordes of of the economically disenfranchised pushing shopping carts that you really you've never seen anything like it you're talking about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people filling the streets who are all homeless all economically disenfranchised. I've never seen anything like that anyplace else. So, and that was when I was there, which is a pretty long time ago now. So, for it to have gotten very much worse than it was when I saw it, yeah, that's, I know this guy dumped enormous amounts of money into this race, um, but the conditions are ripe for a right wing candidate to win. And what Cenk is saying there, that uh, these, you know, she's going to do more of the same. He's being careful. He's being careful. He's not using the language that a Republican would use, but he's making a Republican argument against liberal municipal policies. He's essentially saying, we've had enough of this lib shit. This is how we got it. That's what he's saying. He's not saying it because that would lose him just too much of his audience and credibility with that audience. But He's making a Republican argument against liberal uh, policy theory. Yeah. All right. So two quick points here. One about Caruso being a de facto Republican. We had uh, Shahid Buttar on the show last week, and he explained this. For people who don't know, California has what are sort of uh, referred to as jungle primaries. So basically when they have primary races, it's not that, okay, one Democrat wins their primary, one Republican wins their primary, and then they face off in November. You have a jungle right. primary yeah, where yeah. everybody gets yeah. in, and then the top two candidates right. are the ones who face off in a runoff right. uh, in That's November. why this guy had to become a Democrat. Exactly. So if you are a Republican, you are much better off, no matter how far towards the center or the right you are it, within the GOP, you're much better off just running as a Democrat. Uh, right. This way, if you can get enough people to vote for you, you, the Democrats since January, will face off against Karen Bass, obviously lifelong member of the Democratic Party. So he is basically a GOP. He's a Republican. Right. Now, he's a, he's a centrist Republican in the Giuliani mold. Like In the know, Giuliani people, mold. Okay, people might so, not remember this, but the Giuliani who ran 
for mayor of New York was was pro gay marriage. Right. Was right, pro right, choice. Right. Pro choice. He, yeah. co- he couldn't have won otherwise. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So on the Giuliani point, I think it's important, and this is why I say, you know, for a progressive like Uger, um, it's important to note. Okay, let's take New York for an example, since Russell and I both live here. Um, since Giuliani, New York has been on a one-way slide towards uh, becoming what it is now, which was a deeply unequal neoliberal hellhole. By the numbers, the most unequal city in America. Exactly. Exactly. It, 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 the people have the highest credit card debt in New York. Yep. You have the greatest disparity between the bottom and the top. Well, and of course. It, oh, yeah, that's Giuliani's legacy. It is. It is because you can't pay rent with and a credit Bloomberg. card. You got to pay your cash with rent. So then you rack right. up the credit card right. debt with everything right. else because half your right. money is going into right. housing. Right? right. And so this is just a trend that got started exactly how this is going to get started now if Caruso wins in Los Angeles. Now, he's still the underdog, but he's close to within single digits. And so if you're a guy like Jenk Uecker, right, with this concern for the working people, right, um, how do you not see that pattern there? Right. I mean, how do you not recognize, Okay, yes, this is how it starts. We have to get people off the streets, put them out of sight, out of mind. Right. Well, what does that mean? That a lot of me that uh, very often means just disappear them. We don't actually pay attention to where they go. Soylent Green. It's made out of people. That's one of your tour guidelines that you use when they ask about the Giuliani years. Right. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. And so what kind of fix are you really talking about? Like I said, I'm not that upset about this because I'm not that invested in Karen Bass winning. I mean, it doesn't really bother me, I guess. But this is this is the first step in Los Angeles becoming well, what New yeah, York yeah. is. Now, it's already yeah. almost there. All these major cities are well, almost Gi- there. Giuliani already. sent out the shock troops and then Bloomberg, once Giuliani made it safe for them, brought in the real money right the money right of course of course now this guy is sort of i mean you could make the bloomberg comparison as well here since this is already a businessman right who's already going to i mean that he's going to really combine those two legacies really if he wins which is still right right not right likely he will right but right. that's that's what jank is sort right. of lining up right well this guy's him. the uh president of the like police association caruso that's his like one political job with political experience. Um, so yeah, no, you're right. It is like Giuliani and Bloomberg combined. You got you got a billionaire real estate developer with deep ties to the police. Like you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's that's uh, you know, it's like it's like it's like to stick with the X Men theme. It's like Rogue. He absorbed all their powers. Right. Right. Exactly. So we so we have someone here. So listen. So Rick. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. So Rick here says Caruso will fix the homeless problem. I've never seen a more ruthless politician. He couldn't care less about coming off his PC. Rick, that's how Giuliani won. What you're saying right now, that's how Giuliani won. And speaking of things that I tell my tour clients, this is how I explain the legacy of Giuliani for New Yorkers. The whole time I was growing up, everybody talked about how they somebody needed to come in and clean up this city, how terrible it was, how it didn't used to be that way. And so they voted for Giuliani and he did what they elected him to do. And he did it surprisingly quickly. Almost no sooner was Giuliani elected than they were out fixing the potholes on Sixth Avenue. They were they got rid of the squeegee men. This is one of those symbolic stupid things that matter a lot to people you used to we, you couldn't stop at a light without a guy coming over with a bucket and a squeegee to start squeegeeing off your window and a, a lot of times that actually made the window dirtier because they weren't maintaining uh they right, weren't right, maintaining right. the water so it was just all filthy so giuliani ran on that specifically it was one of his main taglines but it symbolized a lot of other things right he's going to get rid of the squeegee men that had other connotations right so he gets elected and man it was like overnight that the tent cities were gone the streets full of cardboard boxes refrigerator boxes that people were living in gone 
the constant road work, constantly the roads being fixed. It's hard to uh, imagine it now, but Manhattan, when you drove down 6th Avenue, it, that, that was like driving down a road in Guatemala back then. Like the whole car would just be doing this the whole <laughs> right. time. I remember I was in a cab with a British guy back then. He goes, he was shocked because it's New York City. Like, you know, and he's from right. a f- then functional society. He goes, this is like the fucking third world here. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like he couldn't believe the roads in the middle of Manhattan were, were that bad. So Giuliani, he cleaned all that up. And then what you had was what I call the sex and the cityfication of New York. Because once he did that, he who do you think they did that for? You see, at first, the population really dug it. That's why he got a second term, right? Oh, wow, look what he did. Because you had this little window there, which if this happens in Los Angeles, you'll probably have that there too. You have this little window before the gentrification sets in where, okay, now it's safer and it's cleaner and your favorite diner is still there. That is a very brief period, okay? That's the calm before the storm, because once you make it palatable to the kind of person that never would have lived there before, which in the New York case were the Sarah Jessica Parker people, all the things you loved, those things are going to go with that crime that you were complaining about. Your favorite clam bar, that gallery, that little theater, that crazy little eccentric shop that sold uh, Tibetan instruments. All that shit is going to go too, and be replaced by an endless sea of banks and Ralph Lorenz, right? So then you go back, you talk to those same people who wanted Giuliani. Oh, I miss it the way it was. Oh, you (laughs) remember that clam bar? Oh, they had the best. Oh, my God. Do you remember? Do you remember there was that little gallery over there? Oh, I forget the name of it. You talk to those people. They're so nostalgic for the pre-Giuliani period. And yet they were the people who elected Giuliani because when they elected Giuliani, they wanted a world that could have existed, but no one like Giuliani and certainly no one like Bloomberg would ever give you that world, a world where it's safer and cleaner, where you, you haven't gotten so rapaciously capitalistic, where you haven't thrown open the doors to the gentrifiers so wide and the developers so wide that it destroys the city so fundamentally that you'd rather have the crime back than to have what you have now. And that's native New Yorkers. You talk to them, they will take back the crime if they could have back New York. That's what you'll wind up with with someone like this. Please clap. <laughs> 